Well, good evening, or in the case of where this class is originating today, good morning. Uh, there are three different time zones in Australia, so it's uh, been a challenge to organize with everybody. But, you know, let's, uh, let's hopefully that we will uh, be able to get things started. And um, let me uh, do a couple of things here. Um, We'd like to say thank you to the WET Show, the Water and Wastewater Education, Transport and Training, um, sorry, Treatment. They've been incredibly generous and have, we're hosting these as a, in a partnership with them, but they are also underwriting our Adobe license for fiscal year 2021. And Douglas Lugo, who is the executive director has asked that we um, introduce it with him. So take it away, Douglas. Hello, my name is Douglas Lugo, the director of The Wet Show, and I'd like to welcome you to the session. The Wet Show team has put together as a series of CEU qualification classes that we hope you will find helpful. These are uncertain times. It's extremely important to be up to date on how the wastewater industry has been affected during COVID-19. The Wet Show team has launched the Wet Plus initiative as a one-stop shop for resources meant to help our industry stand tall. Please visit our site, The Wet Show, that's www.ettshow.com, to access these resources. And remember, we are essential. Thank you and enjoy the session. To introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jake O'Brien, um, our board member from Australia, Ben Keeley, would like to say a few words. So take it away, Ben. Get the microphone unmuted. Hello, welcome to yes, you all. It it's uh, great to see you here. And um, Dr. Jake O'Brien is going to give a talk today about pharmaceuticals and also some viral particles, which is particularly uh, on point as far as uh, today's current climate in wastewater. Um, Jake is a fascinating researcher who, to a large extent, has created his own field of, of study by uh, going into untreated wastewater and having a look at uh, pharmaceuticals, both legal and illicit, and uh, developing up new testing techniques to be able to have a look. And uh, when I first met Jake, he was pretty much a researcher of one, and now he's got a whole research team behind him. He's a much more effective researcher than what I am. I get too easily distracted. But I hope you enjoy today's session. It uh, will more than likely be information that you have not seen before. So, uh, best of luck and uh, welcome, Jake. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Let me just uh, put your business card away here. And Jake, just let me hide the screen and take it away. Jake, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Dendra, and thanks, Ben. And um, yes, I am Jake O'Brien, and I am a research fellow at the Queensland Alliance for Environmental Health Sciences, which is based at the University of Queensland. Um, so I'm not really a one-man team, and um, so I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm part of a quite a large group at the University of Queensland who have been working in this field of wastewater-based epidemiology, and our group um, started this um, under the direction of Professor Jochen Mueller, um, but we've also been working with many of the Europeans who have also developed methods, as well as um, people from the US and New Zealand and a few other places. And so, yeah, I'm basically presenting on, a, on behalf of a lot of people within this field um, because a lot of them have made really good and significant tr contributions. So today specifically, my talk is about wastewater-based epidemiology and how measuring biomarkers in wastewater can reveal information about both chemical consumption and population health.
So the origin of wastewater-based epidemiology can be summed up in this slide. We can assume that this was late 1800s because that's about when the first um, wastewater treatment plants, the way that we know them, um, were first built. And the, the simple concept is that if you go to any wastewater treatment plant on any given day and you look at the raw wastewater coming in, you'll definitely see traces of corn. However, in the late 1990s, um, there was a lot of effort put into looking into what type chemicals were in wastewater, um, mainly because people were starting to become more conscious about the chemicals that they're putting into wastewater because um, chemicals that are in wastewater need to be removed so that they're not going out into the environment. And so there'd been a bit of work, well, a fair bit of work actually, in the 1990s looking specifically at pharmaceuticals and their removal during wastewater treatment. Um, but um, as you can see here, this guy is Stuart Kahn, and he was a PhD student at the time at the University of New South Wales. And he was, as far as I'm aware, one of the first people to find methamphetamine in wastewater. So what can wastewater data tell you? So as you've already seen on the previous slide, it can tell us about methamphetamine consumption because we can find traces of methamphetamine in the wastewater influence. So this is raw, untreated wastewater. We can also find MDMA and, and markers of cocaine consumption. And it provides an avenue of further investigation. And depending on how it is used, it may be possible to use it to evaluate interventions. So when we first started this work, um, we had a, a PhD student working with us and um, you can see her picture there. This is now Dr. Funyan Lai, who is a very successful researcher in Sweden. And um, this was from data, some wastewater samples that we collected at the end of 2009. And we simply collected wastewater influent for a two week period. And what you can see here I'll see if I can get the pointer turned on. As you can see, some patterns. So I probably should have labelled these, but um, you can see that some chemicals, which are marked out by these dots and the lines, are going up on the weekend and then coming back down during the week and then back up the following weekend. Whereas um, other chemicals aren't having as much of an effect. So what else can wastewater data tell us? Well, it's a way that we can uh, find out the per capita consumption of a chemical. So we can compare specific locations. So the concept is that there's a number of people connected to a wastewater treatment plant. So if we know this number and we know the amount of a chemical that's going into a wastewater treatment plant, then we can come up with what we call a per capita estimate. And so this allows us to compare different regions. So um, just for example, here's a map of Australia. Um, here's Tasmania at the bottom. Uh, sometimes it gets left off maps and I apologize to the Kiwis that I saw that are on this um, on this webinar because um, the Adobe map um, that we've got at the moment seems to be missing New Zealand. Oh yeah, that's good. Dendra's managed to point at Tasmania for those who can't see it. Anyway, so this is this uh, map that I've got up here. Um, this shows Australia and um, what we've done is we've labelled the capital cities with orange circles that are completely coloured in and this was their cocaine consumption estimated on a per capita basis. So you can see that Sydney, which is about here, has the highest cocaine consumption. This is based off a week of data back in August in 2019, whereas it's hardly consumed in Tasmania, Western Australia. Or if you look at the orange circles um, 
which aren't fully coloured in, you can see that the cocaine usage is much lower. And this is the regional places. And we can also use this type of analysis to conduct temporal studies. And as you can see from this little picture here, this is a graph of nicotine consumption in southeast Queensland. And this is between the year 2010 and 2017. And you can see that this trend in the estimated um, nicotine consumption based off west, uh, wastewater based epidemiology analysis is going down. And it's going down approximately at the same rate as what the survey data tell us. So this is good. It provides confirmation that the surveys are finding out the same things that we can with wastewater based epidemiology. So it basically provides us with another tool that we can, that we can conduct surveys. The types of chemicals this has been done for before include illicit drugs, pharmaceuticals, alcohol, nicotine, disease and diet biomarkers, as well as industrial and biological materials. So as I said before, we started our work here in Australia in about 2009. And um, at the same time, there was a group at the University of South Australia who also started work on wastewater-based epidemiology about the same time. And what we can see here is a time trend of methamphetamine consumption between 2009 and let me get my cursor back up. I've got 2009 here, all the way through to August 2019. So as we go across from left to right, we can see that we end up with this higher resolution granularity. But the thing that I want to point out here is that through using this technique, we could actually see that between 2009 and 2016, we had this more than five-fold change in methamphetamine consumption alone. And this is quite a big increase. But one of the other good things about this data is it tells us about actual consumption. So this is by really large areas. So if we look at Adelaide, Adelaide's a big city in Australia and it covers millions of people. I think it's probably about 1.5. 1.3, maybe it's more. Um, but what we can also see is that um, sometime between October 2016 and December 2016, there was a really big methamphetamine seizure. And this occurred off Melbourne, which is not particularly close to um, Adelaide, but there was 900 kilograms of methamphetamine seized. And then in the following months, we can see that methamphetamine consumption in Adelaide decreased. And again, um, at the end of December 2017, we had another 1,200 kilograms seized off the Western Australia coast. And then in the following reporting periods, you can see that methamphetamine consumption decreases. So maybe this actually provides us a way for estimating how much of a particular illicit drug is being stockpiled within the country. So as I said before, um, wastewater-based epidemiology can also inform on diseases. So we're looking at biomarkers or drugs which are proxies for disease. So there's two types. There's an endogenous, so uh, for example, histamine. So it's a chemical that your uh, body produces in response to allergy. And we can also look at isoprostanes, uh, prostaglandin-like compounds, which are markers of oxidative stress. And for proxies of disease, we can look at these exogenous biomarkers, such as salbutamol, which people take if they have asthma, or we could look at antibiotics or other pharmaceuticals. Uh, we recently published a paper on one specific marker of gout, and 
we think that's a really good marker for gout because people with gout have to take this medication every single day. One of the benefits of wastewater-based epidemiology is that the frequency of sampling can be adjusted fairly easily. So we can take a sample per day or we could do it once per year. And if we look at a really big study that's conducted in Europe each year, they get approximately 100 cities across Europe to collect a week of samples um, from different treatment plants. And they're able to use that to make really good spatial comparisons of the illicit drug consumption in Europe. <clears throat> and the other great thing about wastewater-based epidemiology is that we can do this thing called retrospective analysis and this is from um, having good samples archived. What I mean by archived is that we actually store all of the samples that we collect in really massive freezers so that we can come back later on and reanalyze samples for different chemicals once we have methods developed for them. Another benefit is that we've also got this short time lag and it can be a cost-effective way to answer big picture questions. So for instance, if I was to go out and collect a sample today, I would be able to analyze for chemicals within that sample on the same day. So this can be really powerful, particularly depending on where um, the technique is applied. And currently, we're, we are working on techniques so that we can actually apply this in remote locations where conducting surveys in other ways is very difficult. So this brings me to a really important slide. So in 2016, we set up a really big wastewater sampling campaign in Australia to collect wastewater samples from approximately 100 different wastewater treatment plants across the whole country during our census week. So census is um, a really big deal in Australia every five years. So we basically ask every person in Australia to fill out a survey about where they live, how much money they own, how many kids they have, and a whole heap of different questions. It takes about half an hour to an hour to properly complete the survey. And at the same time that this survey was conducted, we collected these wastewater samples so that we could compare different chemicals being consumed against the different socioeconomics and demographics of the catchments. And as you can see from this slide here, um, on the left-hand side, you can see that um, we've got some pictures of some children, and this is for chemicals that, correlate, that have a negative correlation with age. And over on the right-hand side, we have chemicals with positive correlation with age. And at the very top, we have positive correlation with ERSAD. So this is an acronym that um, basically combines a lot of different indicators of wealth based off the survey data. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, down the bottom here, we have a negative correlation with ERSAD, which is basically meaning um, correlation with poorer people. So if we have a look over here, we can see that amphetamine and methamphetamine have a correlation with age, which is negative, and that it's also associated um, with lower wealth. Whereas over on the very far right hand side, you have poorer people who are older who are using heart medication such as atenolol, antidepressants such as pregabalin, and um, citalopram up here. And the closer you get to this midline, um, the less it actually has to do with wealth. If I go to the next picture, this shows us different markers which actually seem to correlate with wealth. So you can see up here we have enterodial, which is a marker of fibre consumption, and 
also enterolactin, as well as vitamin B3 and proline betaine, which is in citrus. So we can see from this that what seems to be occurring is that people who have higher wealth and the younger specifically um, have better diets. So this is really quite interesting information and we managed to get this um, published by our PhD student Phil Choi uh, within the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States of America. So this was really exciting for us and we think that this is a really nice way that we conduct, can conduct surveys of different chemical consumption and who's consuming these chemicals. Other things that we were able to actually do with this data set is we were able to look in more specifically to find out if any chemical consumption, such as for tramadol, which is a strong opioid painkiller, correlates with any of the other um, measured um, things in the census data set. And so you can see here that um, Tramadol um, has a negative correlation with occupational skill and a positive correlation with occupational labour. So what, this, what we think this means is that people who are in jobs where they're outside doing more manual labour are probably hurting themselves a bit more. So therefore they're in more pain and they're using the likes of Tramadol. Um, so things like this is what we're trying to go into further. I just thought I'd use Tramadol as my one example here. Um, we also looked into um, what correlates with higher socioeconomics and, as I said before, lower opioid intake, but as well as lower socioeconomics. And we find that there's lower fiber consumption and also caffeine intake seems to be lower. <coughs> We also had a look at just a few antibiotics. We didn't look at the whole suite of antibiotics because we've not yet developed methods for them. And we think that there's these possibly not linked to socioeconomics. So in 2016 in Australia, we also set up what's known as the National Wastewater Drug Monitoring Program. Now this has several aims and this is at the time it was to collect consumption data between 2016 and 2019, but we've since been able to extend the program out to 2023. And this is funded by the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission in Australia. And um, the aim is to do spatial and temporal trends. And we do this at 50 locations or approximately 50 locations up to six weeks per year. And we release quite frequent reports. So we're releasing reports three times per year. Specifically for this program, we're looking at eight illicit drugs, as well as fentanyl and oxycodone, which are strong opioids, as well as nicotine and alcohol. Just to give you a bit of a breakdown on where we're actually collecting the samples from, you can see this Australia map here on the right hand side. Um, C stands for capital city, so in Queensland where I am, um, that would be in Brisbane which is over on the coast here. And we also, um, you can see that we cover all of the capital cities in all of the states and territories of Australia as well as some of the regional places. So regional in this case doesn't necessarily mean that it's not an urban centre. And what we've been able to do with this data is we can actually make really good comparisons spatially between different sites. So you can see here that in the state capital, which is Canberra, um, so this is the capital city of Australia, um, methamphetamine consumption is reasonably low. Whereas if we have a look over at methamphetamine consumption in the capital of South Australia, we can see that it can be quite high. So in South Australia, we can see that we're 
getting samples from four different wastewater treatment plants within Adelaide, which is the capital city of South Australia, whereas in Queensland we're getting samples from three different wastewater treatment plants within Brisbane. And um, the reason that we get samples from different wastewater treatment plants in different cities is that often wastewater treatment plants are designed to actually fit um, with the geography of an area. So for instance, Canberra is able to have one wastewater treatment plant that basically covers um, the whole population of Canberra. What we can also see if we look at these lines going across the page is we've got this red line here, which is the regional average. And this tells us about the regional methamphetamine consumption um, of the whole of Australia based off our analysis. And we're covering approximately 50% of the Australian population with all of these sites. So we think that this is fairly representative of what's actually going on. We can see by this black line that um, this is the all site average. So if we take an average of all of the data points, whereas a blue dotted line might be a bit harder to see if you're on a phone, um, this is the capital city average. And we can see that this for methamphetamine, it's just below the all site average. For MDMA, uh, which is also known as ecstasy, you can see that um, the trends are a little bit different. So there's slightly more uh, MDMA consumed in regional places, or at least there was in August last year, than there were in the capital cities. But you can also see that we've got this really big spread in some of the places between the lowest consumption and the highest consumption. And we think this is because chemicals like MDMA are quite recreational. And we think that more of this is used on, on weekends than it is during the week. And therefore we see this really big spread in the data. For cocaine, we kind of see a bit of an opposite picture to what we had for methamphetamine, where we see that the capital city average, as indicated by this blue dotted line, is higher than the regional average. And we can see based on this that most of the cocaine consumption is occurring within Sydney, which is the capital of New South Wales. Because we've been collecting these samples and doing this analysis since August 2016, um, we're also able to pull out these different trends in our consumption data. So these white dots indicate um, the national capital average um, based on the August 2019 collection period. But we can see by these white bars that the first one is August 2016 and the last one is going up to August 2019. So we can see the trend in the methamphetamine consumption within the capital city of New South Wales over this time. We can also see um, what's happening in the regional places of New South Wales. And by comparing um, our different chemicals with this type of graph, we can see that methamphetamine is used more than cocaine, which is used more than MDMA. Because over on the left hand side, we've been able to normalize our estimates to doses per thousand people per day. So, yes, it's absolutely true that some people will consume more of a chemical than others to get the same level of high or whatever it is for their treatment. But we think that this still is a pretty good way to compare the data. Because, for instance, something like fentanyl, it's only a very small dose that you take to have the therapeutic um, use. So that brings me on to what wastewater data can't tell us. And it can't tell us about individual behaviour of whoever's using a specific chemical. 
So it can't tell us about the administration form of a drug or whether or not the drug's being co-consumed or if there's poly drug use going on. It also can't tell us about price, purity, dose frequency, misuse frequency, individual compliance, drug use preferences, user health, sociodemographic characteristics of individuals. So we throw this up here to point out that wastewater-based epidemiology definitely should not be replacing surveys, but it should be used in conjunction with surveys to provide a better understanding of drug use in a community and what are the driving factors, what could potentially be changed to decrease that use. It also can't tell us the underlying reasons for why um, use is changing. So this could either be an individual or from multiple factors. And for pharmaceuticals, it generally cannot distinguish between diverted and therapeutic use. So I see that we've got a question over here on the left hand side from Anish. <clears throat> What's the cost of sample analysis for getting these data and who is paying that cost? That's a very good question. So it, it really depends on the specific chemical that's being tested, the ease of getting samples from a wastewater treatment plant. And um, so if I just give methamphetamine as an example, um, we're able to analyze for methamphetamine using a direct injection method. So basically we're able to spike with a labeled internal standard and filter a sample and analyze it immediately on our machine and therefore cost for that is quite low. Um, but then other chemicals such as fentanyl, you have to do a lot more sample preparation to be able to measure them. So therefore the cost of those is a lot higher. Um, in Australia, as I said before, <coughs> um, the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission is covering the cost of the National Wastewater Drug Monitoring Program. And it's not actually particularly huge what they're paying. Um, we, we get approximately $1.2 million a year to deliver all of this data. And we work with the University of South Australia um, to deliver the project. Okay, so I'll just go back to I might come back to um, some of the questions at the end. So as I said, um, we can't necessarily tell by the wastewater-based epidemiology approach why changes are occurring, but at least we can use it to measure change. <laughs> and for pharmaceuticals, we generally cannot distinguish between diverted and therapeutic use. So I, this brings me on to probably answering Suma's question. Um, so if we really simplify how wastewater-based epidemiology works, you can see that a, a drug or a chemical is consumed. So we can see we've got a tablet here, ends up being metabolized by the body and excreted hopefully into a waste into a toilet which is connected to a wastewater treatment plant which is being sampled. And then generally uh, we use um, liquid chromatography coupled to tandem mass spectrometry to measure the drug residues. <clears throat> However, it's actually not that simple because if we take just a single wastewater treatment plant catchment, we can see that we've got multiple things within our catchment. We've got the community, so we've got where people live, where people work. We also have community-wide facilities such as shopping malls, hotels, events, offices and industry. We also have community services, so this can include hospitals, universities and prisons. And all of these things are connected to the wastewater treatment plant. And as you can see here, we also need a flow meter 
an accurate flow meter at the wastewater treatment plant inlet because this tells us how much water is actually going into the wastewater treatment plant throughout the day. We also need to have an auto sampler at the front end of the wastewater treatment plant if we're trying to estimate the per capita consumption of a chemical. And from this point here, we end up with a collected sample, some way of being able to archive the sample. So in this picture, we've actually got Professor Jochen Mueller in one of our specimen banks. So this is a really large freezer that we have at our institute. And then from there, we need to be able to do some form of sample preparation and chemical analysis. And so using the concentration measured multiplied by the flow, so the amount of water that was going in per day, we end up with what's called the total mass of the metabolite excreted. And if we know the excretion factor of a specific chemical, then we can work out how much of the parent chemical, such as methamphetamine, was used. And if we know this population, then we can also normalize it to the number of people. And if we have some idea of the purity of what's being used in an area, we can also try to come up with the mass of the drug consumed or the number of doses consumed. So overall, it's not a particularly simple approach is what I wanted to point out here. And there's lots of um, potential for different uncertainties that can be associated with wastewater-based epidemiology. So if I talk you through the simple formula of what we have for wastewater-based epidemiology, it's not that difficult. We have the load as expressed by Li, which is normalized to population and corrected for excretion. It's, so this is equal to the concentration of the chemical in the sample multiplied by the flow, um, which is over here, sorry. Um, the SWW just means the daily wastewater sample divided by the population who contributed to the wastewater. And then when we know um, something such as purity or an excretion factor, we can also apply these correction factors to come up with a better or an answer in a different format. However, we rely on a lot of different people to come up with all of these different things. So I, for one, am an analytical chemist. So this puts me over here. So my job is really to develop, to develop and use methods to measure different chemicals within the wastewater samples. In Australia, we're relying on wastewater treatment plant operators um, to collect the samples. For the flow measurements, we also uh, need to work with sewer engineers to ensure that the way that the flow is being measured is appropriate. Correction factors, depending on the stability of chemicals, we've still not worked out a way how to do this properly but we might be able to work with sewer engineers to try to come up with an estimate of how much degradation has potentially occurred in the sewer. Uh, we also need data from pharmacokineticus on excretion factors. And if we're looking at purity, we'd also need to know from the social scientists um, how much, how pure a substance is in that local area. And other thing for excretion factors is the metabolomus. So what other markers are there of these particular chemicals? <clears throat> to determine population, we need to work with population molders. And then who is this actually useful for? Well, lots of people. I've got researchers, epidemiologists, public health officers, policy advisors, criminologists, and these are just some examples. So I thought I'd also take you through some of the challenges of wastewater-based epidemiology and how we try to address them. So 
Over on this left hand side we have a conceptual example. As you can see by um, <coughs> this red line, this is the flow throughout the day. So this is, for example, over a 24 hour period. The very dotted black line, which we can see at the top, this is uh, a modelled concentration of a frequently discharged substance. Whereas the dashed black line, this is representative of the concentration of a rarely discharged substance. So we, re we often rely on operators and existing infrastructure to collect the samples. And as we can see here, if we were using a continuous flow proportional method to collect the samples, we would be able to capture both of these patterns that we see up the top here. Whereas if we were using just a constant pump, as in indicated by this black line, then um, we'd also be able to capture the substances when they're coming into the wastewater treatment plant, but then wouldn't necessarily be in a proportional way. What we often find at wastewater treatment plants is that they have auto samplers that operate in this time proportional mode where they're just taking a sample every um, 15 minutes or sometimes hourly. And it's entirely possible then that we can miss a particular event of a chemical coming through and we don't necessarily end up with uh, particularly representative samples. And this is similar for the other methods of collecting samples. What we absolutely don't want uh, when we have quite large wastewater treatment plants is just a single grab sample because these aren't particularly representative of anything. Um, back in 2011, um, we had been working on trying to identify different population size markers. And um, we had a census in Australia so I'd come up with this idea that if we collected enough samples from different wastewater treatment plants during this census week, and we had the accurate population sizes and good flow data for these, we might be able to find chemicals which have a good relationship between the size of the wastewater treatment plant catchment and the chemical consumption. So as you can see up the top here, it's a bit small, but asulfame, which is an artificial sweetener, has a really good relationship with the population and the amount going into a wastewater treatment plant each day. Um, we can also see a fairly good relationship for the likes of caffeine, paracetamol, carbamazepine, which is an anti-epileptic drug, and things like hydrochlorothiazide, which is heart medication, I think. <coughs> And if we use some fancy statistics, we can model all of these markers to come up with really good estimates of our true population size on any given day. Why is this important? Well, simply populations can change. Wastewater treatment plant operators don't necessarily have particularly good data on the amount of people connected to the wastewater treatment plant. And particularly if this is in an area um, where you do have this seasonal population change, or it might even be a daily population changed. So just in answer to Suma's question on the left hand side, has the team studied seasonal variation? Yes, we have studied seasonal variation for a lot of different chemicals. Um, some of them appear to have relationships, but mainly for illicit drug usage, I think what's actually going on is that it's not necessarily related to the season, it's more related to what's available um, at the time. So let's briefly talk through what makes a good wastewater based epidemiology marker. So this was in a review that I was part of several years ago now. So we've got the requirements of different types of markers here. 
So lifestyle and substance use biomarkers, exposure biomarkers from food and environment, as well as health biomarkers. First one is that they're excreted via urine in consistent amounts. <clears throat> Second point is that they're detectable in wastewater. The third is that they're stable in wastewater. And the fourth is that they have a unique source to human metabolism. So why is this one of interest? It's simply that if there's other sources of that chemical going into the wastewater, <clears throat> we wouldn't be able to tell uh, whether or not it was from human consumption or not. If we then want to use um, these markers as population biomarkers, we also need this low variance in the per capita daily excretion, as I showed on that previous slide. And daily per capita excretion not affected by independent variables, such as season, weather, or geographic location. The one thing that seems to be often overlooked is how stable chemicals or biomarkers are in wastewater. Now, this is not a particularly new aspect. So, Zaccato was one of the early pioneers of wastewater based epidemiology, an Italian researcher. And in 2005, he said, the main aspects to be thoroughly validated involve the chemical and biological stability of the drug's main excretion products and its partition in sewage. So we're talking about 15 years ago now that this was published. So in terms of stability, what appears to have occurred so far is a lot of people have looked at stability in the collected sample which is great. Tell us about how stable it is, either sitting on, on a bench or within storage. And for example, it hasn't turned out very well here. I had cropped it a bit nicer, but um, a lot of people would do this type of assessment just in a bottle on a bench at room temperature or maybe in a fridge. And if we do this type of um, assessment, we find that there's some really good stable wastewater basic epidemiology markers because we don't really see anything going on um, in these graphs here. So at the top here, we have paraxanthine and caffeine. So these are both metabolites of caffeine, as well as metformin, which is used to treat diabetes. And we can see by this, black dashed line going across the page here that all of these chemicals are stable. We've got also artificial sweeteners in here. We've got miscellaneous pharmaceuticals and then we've got markers of asthma and allergy. So um, it's probably not particularly clear on this slide, um, but it's going to become more clear in the coming slides that what we actually have is we have these things called rising main sewers, gravity sewers in um, a wastewater catchment. And we can compare these against control reactors. But on this slide here, all I've done is shown what's called an auto sampler sample. So basically that bench top study. And skip that. So, but if the stability isn't great, I can also investigate preservation. So this is specifically for the collected sample. So if we want to increase the stability of a particular chemical, we might be able to adjust the pH, change the temperature, for example, by freezing, or we could filter the sample or add different preservatives. However, the actual issue is that stability starts at the point where the chemical is released into the sewer. So we can only really influence the stability from the point at which we're in contact with the sample. So this is at the collection point. But we can't influence the stability in the sewer itself. 
So I thought I'd just bring up this slide so that we could have a look at what's actually going on in a usual wastewater catchment. You can see here that we have two different types of sewer, a gravity sewer and a pressurized sewer, which is also called a rising main. In the gravity sewer, we have what's known as a sewer atmosphere. So the gravity sewer's got this layer of air in it, whereas within the pressurized sewer, we can see the difference is it doesn't have any air in it. It's always full. And because of these two different types of environment that we have, we end up with different bacteria and um, organisms growing in these different sewers. And a usual wastewater catchment will be made up of a mixture of both gravity sewers and rising mains depending on the geography. And, they'll, and wherever you have a rising main, you'll also have um, some description of a storage tank or a pump station so that um, the water can flow into it via a gravity sewer and then be pumped up um, to where it needs to go. So we can't control the instewer stability of a chemical or a biomarker, but we can investigate and model it. What I mean by this is that our lab has access to um, these little sewer reactors that we can see over on this left hand side. Um, of course, we have to have a control reactor, which is just partially filled with wastewater, but doesn't have any biofilm. So the biofilm is this organic mass um, with lots of living organisms in it, mainly bacteria, um, which basically can consume the organic compounds coming through. The gravity sewer um, in our reactor is partially filled and has both aerobic and anaerobic biofilms, whereas our model of a rising main is completely full and has anaerobic biofilms. And we have these little plastic carriers within there so that the biofilms have somewhere to actually grow on, so they've got some surface area. So using this approach, we can, we can actually now see these lines for the rising main sewers, as well as the gravity sewers and the control reactors. And what we can see is that we've got different colors going all over the page in different directions. So for example, fexofenadine, uh, we don't really see much because it's stable within the rising main, it's stable within the gravity sewer, and it was stable within the control reactor. But for other chemicals such as um, hydroxydesloratadine, we can see here that in the rising main, it's disappearing quite quickly. So that was within about three hours that it had almost completely gone. Um, within the gravity sewer, <coughs> by the 12 hour mark, it was almost completely gone. But just in wastewater itself, which goes straight across the page, um, it was stable. And just a few other markers just to show you what's going on. So we can also see here paraxanthine, which is a metabolite of caffeine in the control reactor and also within the gravity sewer. It was stable, but in the rising main sewer, it disappears quite quickly. So our comp our sewers are all complex. There's different types and lengths of pipes, different residence times, temperatures, pH, pumping stations, organic matter, different biofilms. And the biofilms can also be location dependent. So for example, <coughs> if you have a really long pipe um, where all of the input is just at one particular end, such as this point here, this is the point where all of the nutrients are when it's coming in. And by the time you get to the other end of the pipe, there's probably less nutrients for the, um, less nutrients and food for the different biofilms to be able to eat. So you might end up with a change in the microbial composition, or you might also just have less biofilm. 
And we're also lucky that we have access to these much larger pilot sewers that we can also conduct these studies on. The difficulty with this is that they're really long. You need a lot of chemical to add in and they're expensive to build and maintain. However, we've used our lab scale sewers and compared them against the pile scale, pilot scale sewers. And we find that uh, they are fairly representative of, this, of each other. So what this means is that we can actually use the lab scale sewers for such comparisons. So I just wanted to emphasize that we need to consider in sewer stability to use wastewater based epidemiology appropriately. <clears throat> so I might go to Mariana's comment at the end. Um, so I thought I'd briefly talk about uh, where is wastewater based epidemiology for viruses and antimicrobial resistance, because you might have seen a bit of this in the news lately, um, particularly when it comes to looking at COVID-19 within wastewater. So I'll start with antimicrobial compounds firstly. So if we go back to our assessment of what makes a good wastewater based epidemiology marker, as I said before, they've got to be excreted via urine in consistent amounts. They've got to be detectable in wastewater, stable in wastewater, and have unique sources um, specific to human metabolism. For antimicrobial compounds, we know that they are detectable in wastewater because there's a lot of studies actually finding them in wastewater. But my understanding is that these other points haven't been assessed yet. However, if we're wanting to look at antimicrobial resistance genes or viruses, it's a bit more challenging because these aren't necessarily highly soluble chemicals and they're not um, necessarily excreted via urine. And so what this means is that then representative sampling of these chemicals or, well, of these genes or viruses becomes a lot more difficult but um, some of them we definitely know they're detectable in wastewater. Um, for example, we had just published a paper um, on the detection of SARS CoV 2 uh, fragments in untreated wastewater in Australia. So, this is markers of the coronavirus that's currently going around. However, we know very little about the stability in wastewater and in terms of unique sources to human metabolism, um, we can't be entirely sure that it is actually coming only from humans. So, so to summarize the take home messages I hope you got from today uh, that wastewater based epidemiology is a demonstrated useful tool for monitoring chemicals used by populations. Suitable wastewater based epidemiology markers must meet a range of criteria. And while wastewater based epidemiology shows promise for antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance and virus surveillance, further research is required to determine its suitability. So I'd like to thank you all for joining today. And if you've got any questions, um, now's the time for that. And I'll start with Mariana's. So Mariana says, in some developing countries, parts of sewer channels are actually open, mostly the most downstream parts near the wastewater treatment plants. Any comments, studies regarding stability transformation of these biomarkers in the open sewer channel? Short answer is no, I haven't come across any studies that have looked into this, but that might be a really good topic for somebody to investigate. Um, June has asked, related to variation, have you seen any changes in chemical consumption due to changes in COVID-19 social behaviours? That's a very good question. Uh, we've 
actively been encouraging our wastewater treatment plant operators in Australia to collect samples um, during this pandemic so that we can look exactly at that. Um, but we haven't started um, measuring markers in these samples for that yet, but we are doing that. And I think it will reveal some interesting things. Uh, Jake, a question came in via text is, is there a resource, a link, a web link, or a way to access the paper that you published on SARS-CoV-2? Absolutely. Um, it's We made it um, open access, so anybody can download that. And it's on the Science of the Total Environment um, journal website. So if I think if you just simply um, look for COVID-2 Wastewater Australia in a Google search, you should be able to find that paper quite easily. Otherwise, just do a specific Google search on the name of that paper, which is should be on the screen at the moment. Yep, it is. Great. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah, there comments? was a question from June. Yeah, I think I've answered. That one. And I do believe this one coming in from Mariana. There you are. I've extracted wastewater samples spiked with certain pharmaceuticals. I could find out the exact concentrations of these spiked pharmaceuticals in the wastewater. Any strategies of how to make use of these extracted samples to analyze other biomarkers which might present in the wastewater? If let's say I have the analytical method for these biomarkers, hmm. I'm not quite sure I understand the question here. So if you've spiked in chemicals, you'd hope to be able to find them in the samples, but um, if you don't necessarily measure the sample both before and after spiking, you won't know how much was originating in the sample. But maybe we can have an offline discussion about that later. Ben, do you have any comments or thoughts that you would like to add? Oh, Jake, is there any particularly um, common chemical um, that everybody would know about which isn't stable or pharmaceutical? Um, yes, so paracetamol isn't particularly stable and um, which is kind of a good thing because paracetamol is also um, quite easily removed during wastewater treatment, which is a very good thing because we use a really massive amount of paracetamol. So sometimes like in our sense stability is a really good thing because it means that we're more confident in our data. But if a chemical is being chewed up easily or degraded within a sewer, then it's probably a better thing for the environment that we're not releasing an active, a pharmaceutically active chemical to the environment. I was interested in your discussion on caffeine because in the on-site wastewater field, um, we've often used caffeine to test for human contaminants contamination, such as a septic leaching into lake water or groundwater, um, a, a lot of the regulators ask us to test for ammonia or phosphorus, but that doesn't tell us whether it's a, a human pollution source. Um, but we've often used caffeine because it's remarkably stable and remains in the environment for up to 45 days. It's, some papers that we've seen there. Is there anything other than caffeine that you would think would be useful for that type of uh, testing for on-site wastewater pollution? Um, so some of the artificial sweeteners yeah. are good because we know that um, they do survive wastewater treatment. So they can at least be used to tell you about the volumes potentially that are being released. But, um, 
yeah, I'll dig out some stuff and um, send it through to you on what I think could be useful. But a lot of the different pharmaceuticals and uh, because that's mainly where the research has been done because people like to have the idea that what's being released to the environment is safe. And the other thing that came to mind as you were giving your presentation is that uh, at that Woodford site, we've got tens of kilometres of gravity flow sewers which are unused through the majority of the, the year and uh, four or five kilometres of rising mains. Um, if you ever wanted to do a test through some gravity sewers and some rising mains, we picked the time of year. Uh, yeah can possibly do those for a, a little bit cheaper than some of the other testing apparatus that you had there. Yeah, that sounds quite good. So um, we've been working with Queensland Urban Utilities for our big pilot sewer setup. So it's actually set up at a uh, wastewater treatment plant in Brisbane. Yep. So what we can do there is we can actually divert a side stream of what's coming into the wastewater treatment plant um, through this system. And um, they actually, our collaborators use it to look at other things as well. So um, they can dose it with um, different chemicals to see if um, what effect that actually has on the odour, for example, of the wastewater. Yeah, odours are a big one in sewers, particularly here in Australia and some of the international people, we've gone so water efficient that a lot of our gravity flow sewers are uh, got a lot more solids accumulation in them than what they were designed to have. And so odours through some of the big cities in Australia is an ever increasing problem. Is that one of the reasons why they built the apparatus? Absolutely. Um, so one of the issues that we have in Australia, and I'm sure it's elsewhere as well is this thing called concrete corrosion or concrete cancer and um, this is basically as a result of hydrogen sulfide production that occurs in the sewer and so if you're releasing these this hydrogen sulfide gas um, it fairly simply corrodes the concrete and if a lot of our pipes are made out of concrete this is a very bad thing because that means that the wastewater doesn't necessarily reach the wastewater treatment plant. We end up with leakages. So if we can understand how to, how we could simply modify um, the microbial community within that sewer, um, then yeah, this could have really big benefits. Um, another question that came in via text. It said um, Australia has experienced some wild fluctuations in your climate pattern and some pretty horrendous natural um, disaster events. How have these been factored in for your treatment protocols, the testing protocols? So, um, yes, we, we have events all the time here in Australia. If it's not a fire, then it's a flood or some other natural disaster. But where possible, we just ask operators to please continue sampling and <clears throat> notify us if there is anything that's changed about their catchment. Because we're collecting wastewater at the um, inlet of the wastewater treatment plant. So it's not affected by treatment processes. So but at least by collecting the samples, we might be able to then look to see what impacts, say, the example of a bushfire has had on the people. Um, there might also be markers of smoke inhalation that you can find in the wastewater. So things like that you, you could potentially do. Okay, another, just yeah, with, another question that just came in via text was, uh, in the institutions that you listed on, and they couldn't remember which slide it was, that you mentioned hospitals, schools, and prisons. Have you done point testing at any specific institution? 
Um, we have years ago, we were looking at um, hospitals specifically um, to try and estimate how much of particular pharmaceutical was originating from the hospital versus how much was entering wastewater treatment plant um, from general community use. And so that, and then um, about 10 years ago, we or nearly 10 years ago, we published a paper looking at um, wastewater-based epidemiology, um, specifically for use as a way to find out about illicit drug usage in a prison. And we published that, and we also published a lot on the ethics surrounding using this approach for smaller communities such as prisons. So I didn't discuss the ethics in today's presentation, but it's something that definitely needs to be considered and factored in when designing such studies. Because the whole idea that um, you're getting wastewater that comes from a community, um, it's not necessarily everybody in that community that's using an illicit substance. We have to remember this. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, we do have a little bit of time here. If anyone has a microphone and would like to ask you a question in person, uh, do let us know in the chat window. And I'm sure both speakers are happy to stick around for a little while after we end the public portion. Well, thank you so much. Jake, I, I learned a great deal, and I'm sure everyone who attended this as well uh, has got a new perspective on uh, we really are what we eat, or in this case, swallow, or in this case, flush, I suspect. Uh, ben, do you have any final comments? Thank you very much, Jake, for presenting today. I'm sure a lot of people have learned new information. I learned a lot of new information by being able to have a look at your presentation. And uh, thank you for keeping everybody engaged. No worries. Thanks for having me. And um, if people want to just Google <coughs> my lab, they can also find out about some of the other things that we've been working on. Because you can see from the photo, there's actually quite a lot of us. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And that's what I was trying to, to get at before. Just about every other water research group that I've dealt with in the last 10 to 15 years has decreased in size. And it's a bit depressing. But your group is just expanding and doing so much uh, wonderful research. It, it's great to see it happen. And I just put that web link into the chat window as well. Uh, afterwards, as I said, you will have the opportunity to either log in and watch the full presentation in this Adobe room. Uh, when we translate this into the YouTube version, uh, none of the links will be interactive, but we'll make sure that they go into the notes underneath there. Do feel free to share that link when it's available. We will be following up afterwards. Uh, those who attended will receive a, a email that will constitute your certificate of attendance if you are taking this for professional development hours. You can use that for submission to prove that you enjoyed sitting here listening to something that was quite fascinating and we do have to say thank you to Mark Davis for the image credit. Uh, this is the city of Perth at night so I'm sure that sampling the wastewater treatment plant in Perth was quite an experience. So, um, thank you both so much for your time and thank you ladies and gentlemen for your attendance tonight. We're going to end the recording now but we will stick around for a little while longer if you would like to carry on the conversation. Uh, thank you again. We will look forward to seeing you in the next event uh, which is coming up I believe May 20th and that will be Professor Ted Gardner from the University of Victoria. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.